Reedy Creek Publishing presents The Christmas Story from the novel Martin's Way by B.R. O'Hagan, read by Jake Gardner. I was starting to nod off after breakfast when Gwen skipped into my hospital room and clambered up onto my bed. Jimmy was right behind her, and in a flash, my six-year-old granddaughter was cuddled up against my left shoulder, while her five-year-old brother crawled beneath a web of tubes and monitor wires and nestled against my right flank. I surrender, I said. If you don't tickle me, I promise I'll even eat my broccoli. Scout's honor, said Jimmy. That's a big promise. I hugged him and pushed the control to raise the back of the bed to an upright position. Scout's honor, I answered. Now what are you two doing in this stuffy old hospital when you should be at the park? And where are your parents? Gwen wrinkled her brow and took hold of my hand. You're pretty silly, Grandpa, if you don't know why we're here. Mommy said the doctors and nurses don't have the kind of cheer-up medicine that Jimmy and I make, so we brought you some. We brought you a lot, said Jimmy. I bet you did, Jimmy. Now where are Mom and Dad? Do they think you've run away to join the circus? No, 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 sang Gwen, bobbing her head in time to the blips on the heart monitor behind my bed. They're having lunch in the cafeteria. Dad said he thought you might like some time just with us. How about another twenty years, I thought. Well, good then. What shall we do, chase some pirates or maybe catch a couple of wild ponies and break out of this joint? We can't do that, Granddad, said Gwen. Mom says you have to stay right here in this bed until it's time for you to go to heaven. Gwen! Jimmy shot his sister a withering glance. Gwen scooted closer. Well, she did, Granddad. That's exactly what she said. And she was right, Gwen. But I think Jimmy would rather not talk about that. It can sound kind of scary. Jimmy tugged at the sleeve of his baseball shirt and turned his head away. So, do you really have to go away forever, he asked. He looked at me expectantly, and I knew what he wanted to hear, what they both wanted to hear. The granddad was going to get better and be able to take them to the park. That I'd be able to team up with them once again in the time-honored coalition of grandparents and grandchildren united against their common foe, the parents. I stretched my arms out as far as the IV needles in my forearms permitted and I pulled my grandchildren close. In the corridor outside my room, the hustle and bustle of a busy hospital went on ceaselessly. Inside room 512, though... The world had stopped spinning, if only for a moment. Well, forever's an awfully long time, Jimmy. No one lives that long, but no one is alone that long either, especially not in heaven. Heaven is where you get to be surrounded by the people you love, where you never have to be apart from them again. Just then, Nurse Marsden bustled into the room. She was all business. She sized up the situation, planted herself in the middle of the room, and put her hands on her hips. She narrowed her eyes, glaring at each of the children and then me, before smiling and asking, So, what will it be for your roommates, hot cocoa or fruit smoothies? I nudged my fellow conspirators, and they hopped off the bed to follow the nurse down the hall. When they returned a few minutes later with their drinks, the nurse pulled two chairs alongside my bed. Gwen and Jimmy plopped down and promptly put their feet up on the bed rail. What should we talk about, I asked. How about school? Not today, said Gwen. How about a story? I'd love to hear a story, I said. What kind would you like to tell me? No, not her, said Jimmy. You tell a story. Right, Gwen? Mom said maybe you would like to tell us a story like the kinds you always tell at Christmas, the ones about your family back in the olden days. Well, we do have Coco, said Jimmy, so that sort of makes it like Christmas. You okay with that plan, Gwen? The story I'd like to tell you is about my grandmother, Elizabeth, when she was just about your age. Gwen sat up. Was she like me, Granddad? You mean, was she brave and funny and smart? She was. Very much like you. In fact, your great-great-grandmother had more courage than anyone I have ever known. Jimmy looked a bit uncertain. He pulled an electronic game out of his pocket and turned it slowly around in his hand. Back up, I supposed, in case my story didn't contain the right ingredients, which for him usually meant rodeo cowboys or expeditions into uncharted jungle territory. I pushed the button to change the angle of my bed a bit and took a final drink of my protein shake. The activity in the corridor outside my room softened to a low murmur. Jimmy and Gwen shifted around in their chairs, anxious for the tale to begin. 
I closed my eyes for a moment, recalling memories of Grandmother Elizabeth. She had been a frontier rancher, teacher, and homemaker, quick to laugh and always in motion. That was Elizabeth. My earliest memories of visiting her home weren't so much of activities as they were of smells, of yeast and molasses and fresh-baked bread, of peppermint and maple syrup and apple pies cooling on the windowsill. I cleared my throat. I wonder how I should begin. With once upon a time in the olden days, giggled Gwen. With once upon a time in the olden cowboy days, added Jimmy. Well, you know... That's exactly where Elizabeth's story begins, once upon a time in the olden cowboy days. Her parents joined the Great Migration West in the years after the Civil War. They filled their Conestoga wagon with everything they owned and made the perilous journey from Ohio to the Montana Territory. They carved out a homestead in a great valley filled with tall forests and wide grassy meadows, their land was bounded on three sides by a trout-filled stream and on the fourth by a stand of lodgepole pines that swept right up to the base of the Bitterroot Mountains. Elizabeth's father built a log cabin close by the stream. It was a tight, warm house with real glass windows, an enormous rock fireplace, and a hardwood floor. He lined the porch rails with wooden planters for seed flowers and herbs, and behind the house he built a shed for the horses and their milk cow. His wife put two cane rockers on the porch where they would sit and look across the creek over the sweet grass meadows and up into the snow-tipped mountains. In the summer of 1876, when Elizabeth was only a few months old, a grizzled old trader arrived at the cabin. His wagon was the horse-drawn supermarket of the frontier. With an assortment of pots and pans, bolts of cloth, sacks of sugar and coffee and beans, small bags of striped candy and even a few books. Elizabeth's parents welcomed the old man into their home for the night. Next morning, in thanks for a homemade supper and a soft bed, he dug a tiny sapling out of his wagon and gave it to Elizabeth's mother. The willowy tree was not from these parts, he said. In fact, it had come all the way from Africa and was said to blossom just once in its lifetime, producing great bunches of scented flowers from which the most expensive perfumes in the world were distilled. Her parents thanked the trader, and he headed off to the next ranch. Even though they chuckled at the idea that this was a magic tree, her father planted it in a patch of wildflowers down near the creek. That summer they added a second room to the cabin and cleared trees from the fields to plant wheat and corn. Her father started a small blacksmith business, and her mother helped him work the fields and care for the livestock. It was hard work from first light of day until well after dark, but it was satisfying for the young couple to see their dreams come alive and to watch the small town where they attended Sunday service begin to grow and prosper. And then, not long after Elizabeth's third birthday, her mother fell ill. The doctor did all he could to help, but he was unable to control her fever. As the first autumn winds swept down the bitter root and into the valley, Elizabeth's mother passed away. The child was too young to understand the gathering of people around the grave a few days later, or the pain that was etched on her father's face as he planted a small white cross to mark her mother's final resting place. Gwen shifted in her chair. Granddad, I don't think I like this story. It's pretty sad. I smiled. Some of the best stories start that way, don't they? Sad things happen in life, and they teach us about the things that really matter. But even though Elizabeth lost her mother, her story was just beginning. Did she still have a lot more to learn? asked Jimmy. She did, I said. A lot more to learn about happiness and sadness and about why living a full life takes a lot of courage. Okay, tell us some more, Granddad. After his wife's death, Elizabeth's father poured himself into his work, returning home to his daughter and housekeeper long after sunset. Each night he read to Elizabeth in front of the fireplace until she fell asleep in his arms. His only purpose in life now was to care for her, to build a future for her that would be happier than his own. A long dark winter followed that terrible autumn. But when the spring thaw came, Elizabeth's tree burst forth in clusters of bright green leaves for the first time. No flowers bloomed, but its leafy canopy created a refuge from the blistering summer sun that grew thicker and fuller with each passing year. 
In the summertime, her father knew he would find Elizabeth playing under the outstretched branches of her special tree each evening when he rode in from the fields. And on Sundays after church, they picnicked on the grassy carpet that spread around its base. One lazy afternoon, as they watched clouds drift high overhead, Elizabeth asked her father how far away heaven was, and if it was so far above them that humans could not see it. He pointed across the horizon to a V-shaped notch that had been carved by weather into the granite between two mountain peaks. Do you see the pool of light nestled in that rocky cleft just where the snow line begins, he asked. Elizabeth nodded. She'd seen the last of the evening light settle in that place before. It was as if the wick of a golden lantern was slowly fading. That's no ordinary light, he said. It's kind of like a rainbow, a promise of God's love for us. When you see a promise like that, you know that heaven is close by, so close that you can see it. It doesn't matter where you are or what's happening in your life. The promise is always close by, especially when times are difficult. It was a promise Elizabeth would never forget. On Christmas Eve that year, a full moon settled over the snow-draped valley. Elizabeth's father carried a small burlap bag out into the still, cold night and spread its contents around the base of her tree. There were green, red, and gold glass ornaments, a ball of scarlet ribbon, and dozens of small candles. He hung the ornaments on the tree's ice-coated branches and wound the ribbon around its trunk and limbs. Then he wedged the candles into the hollows of the branches and lit them. The effect was magical. Candlelight bounced off the ornaments, spraying ribbons of color across the snow, and the tree's reflection sparkled like a basket of precious jewels on the surface of the creek. He returned to the cabin and pulled a sleeping Elizabeth from her bed. Wrapping her in a warm comforter, he carried her down to the creek bank and laid her gently on a thick, warm buffalo robe on the snow directly beneath her tree. Then he stepped back so that when she awoke, the tree would be the only thing she saw. It only took a moment. Elizabeth stirred in the chill night air, her eyes opened, and she looked around. She was uncertain at first, and for an instant she looked as though she might be afraid. Then she saw the illuminated tree her father standing close by, and her eyes widened in astonishment. Oh, but I must be dreaming, she thought. The icy branches glittered with the reflection of candles bouncing off the glass ornaments. She clapped her hands in delight at the streamers of color that splashed across the snow as the ornaments twirled slowly in the night breeze. Elizabeth sat up and watched the light from her tree spill down the creek bank, pour into the water, and float off in the direction of the towering mountains. Could her mother see the tree and its glittering lights from heaven, she wondered. She looked over at her father and saw that he was smiling for the first time since they'd lost her mother. He was looking across the valley high up into the mountain pass where light from the full moon was beginning to pool. Elizabeth knew he was wondering the same thing. Her father stood watch until Elizabeth fell happily asleep on the snowy mattress beneath her tree. The only sound for miles when he scooped her up and walked back to the cabin was the crunch of snow beneath his boots. He put her in her bed, stoked the fire, and pulled his chair near the window. Outside, the candles in her tree flung a golden curtain across the blue-white snow. Droplets of colored light from the ornaments dotted the snowscape. High above, gleaming like a crystal shower, the winter stars twinkled their approval. Okay, I like that part a lot better, said Gwen. Yeah, that would be a really cool Christmas tree, Jimmy added. Before I could respond, a lab technician entered the room. It was time for my blood draw. But the ever-vigilant nurse Marsden had seen him turning into my room, and she whisked in right behind him and asked if he could return in a while. But don't get your hopes up, Mr. Forrestal, she said as she left. You and your teammates have to break this party up in 30 minutes. Boy, she's just like Mom, said Jimmy. She sees everything. Jimmy, that's not the half of it, I replied. I don't even think she sleeps. What happened then to great-great-grandmother Elizabeth, asked Gwen. Did she sleep under her tree every night after that? Not exactly, I said. But that tree wasn't done with its magic, that's for sure. Elizabeth was growing up, and so was the valley around her. Settlers from the east poured in during the 1880s in search of cheap land and opportunity, and their small town became the county seat. 
Elizabeth went to school and church and made many new friends. When she turned 12, she told her father that she was ready to take over the housekeeping chores. Her father continued to work tirelessly at building up the ranch. He purchased an adjoining homestead, raised a herd of cattle, and grew his blacksmith business into a prosperous enterprise. Elizabeth's tree was growing as quickly as she was. Each spring it sprouted patches of shiny green leaves. Each fall they turned orange and brown and fell to the ground without flowering. She read books, wrote poems, and daydreamed about the future on the soft grass beneath its outstretched arms whenever the weather permitted. And she and her father decorated it every Christmas. On Christmas Eve, they would bundle up with warm coats and hot chocolate and sit beneath its ice-coated branches to watch the light dance across the snow and shimmer on the surface of the creek. Elizabeth could have lived this way forever, but, as she would say when she was telling the story to my brother and I many years later, the fates don't often take the dreams of humans into account when balancing their books. And so it was that when Elizabeth was 14, her father was badly injured in a rock slide on the slopes of Willow Mountain where he'd gone in search of a stray calf. A neighbor found him bloodied and nearly frozen on the rocky trail just above the snow line. He had a broken shoulder, broken ribs, and a busted leg. But he had managed to crawl through the thick brush and snow for several miles in a heroic effort to get back to his daughter. The neighbor laid him over the back of his pack horse and brought him to the cabin. The doctor set her father's broken bones as best he could and then helped Elizabeth wrap him in heavy blankets on a cot by the fire. Your father has internal bleeding, the doctor explained, and probably other injuries that's difficult to determine. Only time would tell if he would survive. The doctor and the pastor looked in on them for the first few days, but when the weather progressed from a light snowfall to an arctic blizzard, the road from town became impassable. Caring for her father was Elizabeth's job now. There would be no one to help her until the storm cleared. She stayed by his side day and night for three weeks, leaving only to feed the animals or bring in firewood. She read to him from the same books that he had read to her when she was a child. When he was chilled, she fed him with warm soup, and when he was racked with fever, she kept a cool cloth on his forehead. Elizabeth barely slept. Each time her father stirred or coughed in pain, she wakened and did all she could to soothe him. She had no medicine, no dressings or bandages, and no training in how to care for someone so badly injured. There was no one to help her, to comfort her, no one for her to even visit with. When he slept, she sat by the fire, remembering all of the special times they had shared and all of the plans they had made for the future. She recalled the story of how her tree had come to be planted on the bank of the creek and about the legend the old trader told her parents about the tree's magical origins on the far side of the world. Each autumn, she and her father had watched its withered leaves fall to the ground. Never once did the tree bring forth a flower, and the very idea that it could produce a crop of rare perfume blossoms made them laugh. Day after long day, as the winds howled around them and the ice and snow battered the walls of their little cabin, Elizabeth's father fought valiantly for his life. On December 23rd, the great blizzard began to subside. As the last of the storm swept out of the valley and onto the vast prairie beyond the mountains, her father gave up his struggle and died peacefully in the arms of his beloved daughter. The next day was Christmas Eve. Elizabeth's friends and neighbors huddled against the biting wind on the bank of the creek near the cabin. A fresh grave had been scraped out of the frozen dirt beneath snow next to her mother's resting place. It was marked with a simple white cross. The ceremony was brief, as befit the humility of the man and the severity of the weather. Her father had been a good neighbor, a respected businessman and a friend who could always be counted on to help anyone in need. Elizabeth politely declined the many invitations to join friends for Christmas celebrations. As each group climbed into their buckboard wagon and pulled their lap robes tight, Elizabeth handed them a jug of hot, spiced apple cider. She stayed outside on the porch until the last wagon disappeared around the red cedars at the bend in the road. Her heart ached with the sorrow and loneliness as deep as the bitter cold. But it wasn't until the sun dipped below the mountain crest that Elizabeth returned to the warmth of the empty cabin. That night, the valley rested peacefully under a blanket of powdery snow. 
A full yellow moon sat high above the granite peaks, and the smoke from Elizabeth's chimney curled lazily into the winter sky. She sat in her father's chair by the kitchen window, gazing past her tree across the frozen meadow and up into the towering purple mountains. She was searching for the exact places where their craggy peaks made contact with heaven. As the moon settled above the cabin, she pulled a heavy quilt around her shoulders and went outside. A carpet of stars swept across the sky and the air was perfectly still, as if the earth was holding its breath. Elizabeth turned away from the warm cabin and its memories of happier times and dropped to her knees on the soft snow beneath her tree. She began to cry, and her tears melted tiny holes in the snow. Her pain and loneliness at last gave way to exhaustion, and she fell asleep beneath the tree. Dawn spilled softly into the valley the next morning, pouring over the mountain peaks and across the valley floor. The sun woke Elizabeth with a gentle caress. Her eyes opened to a bright and glorious Christmas landscape. A clump of snow fell to the ground from a tree across the creek. The Bitterroot Mountains glowed rose and violet, and a wisp of smoke drifted from the cabin chimney. Elizabeth stretched and pulled the quilt tight around her shoulders. The warm sun felt good, and for a moment she forgot the hurt of the last few days. Then a ray of light glanced off the white cross that marked her father's grave. Pain flooded her heart, and she began to cry. She felt so alone. It would be unbearable, so difficult to go on. She wiped at her tears and turned her head in the direction of the cabin. The milk cow was waiting for her, and the hens needed to be turned out and given their scratch corn, and the horses would need a ration of oats and molasses. Life went on, and so did the chores. Elizabeth leaned her head back to shake a dusting of snow from the quilt. As she did, something caught her eye. Something remarkable. But it couldn't be, she thought. Not here, not now, and certainly not after the worst blizzard in a quarter century. She felt the morning chill on her face. Her feet were aching with cold, and she could smell the smoke from the chimney. This wasn't a dream. Elizabeth threw off her quilt and stood up. A feeling of joy washed over her. Her tears stopped, and her heart swelled with happiness. She stepped back and looked up through the branches of the ice-coated tree. What she saw was nothing less than a miracle. In the dead of winter, on a sun-drenched bank of a frozen Montana creek, a promise had been fulfilled. The tree that her father planted 14 years ago was no longer just an icy skeleton. Elizabeth was astonished to see one limb was now covered in a mass of gossamer white flowers stretching from the trunk of the tree to the tip of the branch. The rest of the tree was as bare and icy as the day before, wrapped tightly in its coat of winter frost. Just one branch, arching high above all the others, had burst into bloom. Each one of the thousands of tiny flowers on the remarkable limb had a splash of deep red color in its center. A fragrance of rose and lavender and jasmine filled the air. It was the most wonderful perfume Elizabeth could imagine. The old trader's promise had come true. The tree he gave to Elizabeth's parents had blossomed just as he said it would, and on Christmas Day. Elizabeth took a few steps back so that she could take in the entire tree. It was then that she noticed something else about the tree's lone flower-covered branch. It was positioned exactly so that it arched protectively over the two wooden crosses that marked her parents' final resting place. Elizabeth returned to the cabin. She heated a mug of cider, went out onto the porch, and settled into her mother's rocker. Across the creek, beyond the snowdrifts, and above the cedar forests, the great mountains maintained their silent vigil. Elizabeth was certain of one thing. When the mountain snows melted next spring, a new pool of light would be visible high up in the cleft of the mountain pass, right next to the one her father pointed out that summer evening when she asked him if heaven was close by. Her tree stood loving guard over the two snowy graves. As Elizabeth watched, two white petals fell from the branch and were carried in the arms of a gentle breeze toward the waiting mountains. Gwen and Jimmy were leaning forward in their chairs as I finished the story. I set my water glass down. Grandmother Elizabeth told us that story every Christmas, I said, and each time she told it, it was like the first time I ever heard it. She was so brave, said Gwen. She took care of her daddy all by herself. 
And she had to take care of the animals and chop wood with the big axe, too, said Jimmy. I was pleased to see that Jimmy's electronic game hadn't been switched on. Yes, she did, and in fact she worked that ranch by herself for a whole year until her aunt and uncle came west the next year and settled in with her. Did her tree ever grow flowers on it again at Christmas time? Gwen asked. Not at Christmas time or any other time. Her miracle came when she needed it most. That's the way that most real miracles happen. A crowd appeared at the door to my room. Eric, Rachel, Peter, Marjorie, and Connie, they squeezed inside. Come one, come all, there's room for you here. We'll have ourselves a proper shindig. How are the kids, Eric asked. Oh, they were a treat, I said. We chatted for half an hour until Gwen and Jimmy reached the end of their respective five- and six-year-old attention spans. It was time for them to go. Hugs and kisses and goodbyes were exchanged. Peter, Marjorie, and Connie were going to walk Eric and Rachel and the kids out to their car, then come back up to spend more time with me. As the group departed, Gwen asked her mother if she could ask me a question in private. Rachel looked at me and then told Gwen to be quick. The rest of the group left me alone with my granddaughter. Granddad, that was the best Christmas story you ever told us, even though it isn't even Christmas. Well, thank you, honey. I hope you'll share it with your own family forever and ever. Gwen laid a hand on my shoulder. Granddad, I have a question. Since Elizabeth got to have a miracle happen after her parents went to heaven, does that mean that I get to have a miracle after you go to heaven? I blinked back a tear and took her hand. Gwen, the truth is that we all get to have miracles in our lives. The secret is to keep your eyes and heart open so you'll know when your miracles happen. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Okay, Granddad, I'll watch really careful. She paused and looked in my eyes. When you go to heaven, I promise I'll be brave and help everybody for you just like Elizabeth did. Then she turned and walked out. Gwen's footsteps echoed down the hall. For a moment, the only sound in my room was the blip of the heart monitor and the soft tap of a tree branch against the window. I was very tired, I realized in the stillness, and I closed my eyes. <laughs> 